And as we proceed with this little study, we, re we realize how many interesting points of view uh, can develop on the level of hypotheses. Wherever the facts are not immediately attainable, we have this inevitable process of the creation of a factual concept. The individual is forever seeking answers. And to the degree that he is baffled, his own ingenuity increases. And he postulates that which he cannot perceive. Experience would indicate over the periods of ages that this process of postulation is intuitively, to a measure at least, correct. The individual, by means of a mysterious faculty which we call common sense, seems to have a certain sense in common with life itself. And as he looks around him and searches within him and seeks to explain that which is beyond his immediate apprehension, he usually arrives at some rather factual conclusions. Uh, these facts, however, are dependent in turn upon his observation of other more or less understandable phenomena. If he makes a serious mistake anywhere along the way, then his final judgment about abstraction is impaired. This is why it is a very risky thing for the individual to move from one unknown to another. He must strive to move from a known to an unknown. And if he can do this reasonably, he is likely to be somewhat close to the truth when he finally forms his hypothesis. Now this evening we're going to start by carrying the study of the atom into the Muslim world. Uh, we know that during what we call the Dark Ages, Islam became the protector of Western intellectualism. Uh, with Europe itself crumbling under the pressures of war and psychological disintegration, the rise of the Arabian area really became the bridge between the old and the new. Had it not been for the schools of philosophy at Basra and Baghdad, we would have had a very sorry time in Europe, and the Renaissance might have been indefinitely postponed. As it was, the Arabs the great romanticists of knowledge did a comparatively good job. Uh, they trans translated Plato and Aristotle and Euclid. And the court of Baghdad became a constellation of scholars. Yet the temperament of the Arab was not essentially the cold, quiet intellectualism of a modern scientist. He was a poet. He loved to involve even anatomy and physiology in high verse. He liked to write books on anatomy in meter. He, he liked to write books on mathematics in the flowery terms of the most abstract mysticism. Well, we could use some of his qualities probably today with advantage. But he certainly was, among the learned people of the earth, one of the warmest groups from the standpoint of his sheer appreciation of beauty and of life and of nature and of art. This led to an elaborate fabulism rising in his thinking. And this, in turn, was more or less curbed or restrained or bounded by the concept of the Koran. To the Arab, the Koran 
is not a book. It is all books. It does not have religious authority alone. It has all authority. And, of course, there are many phases of life that were never touched upon in the Koran. And the study of atoms was one of them. Yet in some mysterious way, this study had to be made to agree with the broad spiritual philosophical concept underlying the writings of the prophet. The peculiar and unique position of deity in Islam therefore determined the development of the atomic theory. It was obvious that there had to be a god behind the atom. This deity was one, indivisible, omnipotent, ever-present. This one was not only scientific and actual and absolute, but Allah was the merciful and the compassionate. Consequently, the universe flowed out of great compassion, and every process of existence was full of mercy. Things were not cold and hard and set and fixed. Everywhere that Allah went, there was grace, there was charm, there was a mysterious velvet glove over the law, but the law was still there. Now, according to the concepts of Islam, God did not create atoms. God merely permitted them uh, to move from a non-manifest to a manifested state. When God said, let there be atoms, he merely called forth an eternally existing factor in existence. He merely placed the authority of his own will upon the new particles that had always existed and laid sleeping until he called them forth. Therefore, God did not create atoms. He did not fashion them. He merely drew them forth out of the infinite supply of materials which had always existed. This was one of the earlier points of difference between Christian and Muslim thinking. For the Muslim would not accept the concept that deity created the universe out of nothing. Uh, to the Muslim, deity brought forth the universe out of its own eternal essences that had ever existed. Here perhaps the Muslim was indebted to contact with far Asia and with the schools of atomism in India. But more directly, probably, his thinking was dominated by the concepts of Aristotle. And it was at this time, more or less, that Aristotle began to take over the management of the philosophical universe, which had previously rested largely in the keeping of Plato. The Muslim declared that the universal procedure consisted of two factors. One, the intention of deity, and the second, the accident of matter. Now, well, this is a kind of a curious combination of thinking. But the supreme intent was fulfilled when Allah said, let there be. And then out of this statement of the demand of being, or the statement of being, there flowed a series of forces, elements, and factors. These began a continuous procedure within the presence of deity. But deity did not say to one of these minute particles, go bump thy neighbor. These accidents, so-called, were the inevitable result of the very things that Allah had brought into being. And once they had been brought into being, they behaved according to their natures. And uh, Allah was not 
primarily, therefore, concerned with the infinite fatalism of each move. These moves were so-called accidents. Accidents, therefore, are things which in the Muslim mind simply represented processes or procedures for which he could conceive of no reasonable explanation. And he therefore took the ground that they were actually unreasonable processes. He did not deny that any one of them might be demonstrated to be reasonable in some manner, but he insisted that this reasonableness was of a secondary order. It was not the reasonableness of God. And as this was the only true reason, all other things had to operate without this true reason, and consequently by accident. Now in this we come also to another interesting theory, because the Muslim atomists uh, were divided into two rather definite schools. And these schools rose and flourished in the 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries of the Christian era, uh, at about the time when Europe was struggling to reclaim itself from an incredible intellectual darkness. The school of Basra was largely directing this thinking about the accidents of matter. Whereas the school of Baghdad, perhaps because it favored uh, the glory and grandeur of the great courts of the caliphs, they had a more, let's say, a emotional or romantic approach to this rather dull subject. Uh, in this school, school uh, the Arabs pointed out one thing, namely that when God said, let there be, he caused to flow into manifestation a fraction, a fragment, a spark of his own divine nature. Now, the moment this spark flowed from him, it died. For it had no life or existence apart from his own nature. Consequently, matter, composed of these indivisible units called atoms, had no continuing existence. Every atom existed only for an inconceivable flashing instant. Uh, the, the life of the atom was a mysterious now that had only the most fleeting actuality. If, therefore, it appeared uh, that the, atom the atomic structures built up to create forms, and these forms to create bodies, these bodies might be uh, caused to include among them such highly evolved forms as man, that these bodies were all of them of only the duration of an instant. Uh, even while we describe the atom, that atom is already dead. While we describe the man, that man is already dead. While we describe the sun, the moon, and the stars, even as we speak of them, they are already dead. But it's obvious that this can't be applied literally or factually, or there would be no one left to describe them. Thus, there has to be another phase of this matter. This phase was to the Muslim thinking therefore, that the perpetuation of all basic material substance results from the continual replacement of this unit or this primary material. That actually what we call life is a series of infinitesimally short instants of existence following each other in a continuous motion very much like the separate frames of a motion picture film, because each frame passing rapidly before the lens of the camera uh, registers its own image and then another takes its place. We have the effect of a continuity of a picture. But actually, in the course of a second, many of these little separate frames 
move past the camera lens. But seeing the result, we behold only one continuous image. But this one continuous image is a continual replacement of small frames of film. And at any moment, if this film breaks at one of these frames, the picture ceases. So the motion picture, it becomes almost a perfect explanation of the Muslim attitude toward matter. It is this matter that is forever being restated or continually being reproduced or represented again. And the, each representation occupying the same place and being of like manner, matter, and moving one after the other in incredible rapidity, we have the concept that we see a solid or enduring object. Now what is the peculiar advantage of such a theory? Why should they have attempted to develop it? I think the reason was theological, because they wanted to explain the continual presence of God in activity. Consequently, the, the base substances of nature exist merely because of the continuously repeating statement, let there be, moving continuously and forever from the divine consciousness. Every minute fragmentary part of an instant, Allah says, let there be. And this continuous procedure results in a continuous unfolding picture in which we are no longer aware that this picture could cease at any instant and that only th the only thing that holds it together is this continual statement of the divine purpose. Thus, uh, the uh, material substances are really maintained or caused to reaffirm themselves by this rippling motion of life from being. And everywhere, at every instant, Allah says, let this instant be. Let this exist. And even before we can twinkle, twink an eye or think or state ourselves, Allah has reaffirmed, let this thing be. And this continual reaffirming is the reason for the continuance of the universe. The deity, or Allah, in thinking, let this thing be, can only have in its abstract consciousness two things that it can cause to be. One thing that it can cause to be is atom. The other thing it can cause to be is vacuum. And both of these are within the power of the divine principle to affirm. Therefore, if uh, the Allah affirms, let there be atom, and continues this affirmation, the atomic universe comes into existence. If, however, Allah shall say, let vacuum be, then instantly universe again falls into chaos. And forever and ever it is in the power of the universal consciousness to maintain or eliminate the universe by any will, purpose, or meaning which the deity may wish to state or affirm. Now we couldn't go too far, perhaps, scientifically on this premise, but there are some rather interesting byproducts uh, that seem to be more than at first appears. It is probably this Islamic group perhaps through their mystics, who were um, strangely enlightened inside of themselves and who were aware of a wonderful luminous energy, uh, invisible to the ordinary perceptions, but apparently forever nourishing space itself. And they also were aware that this energy seemed to continually pulsate. And we know even in our modern researches that many forms of light that we now use uh, continually pulsate, and that in a wonderful way this pulsation is a continuous statement of let there be. But we have now reduced it to a scientific level. And if this restatement by pulsation did not occur, the light would go out.
But the Muslims seem to feel, therefore, that the universe was being continually nourished through its basic substances by an infinitely repeated causal process. And that this nourishment seemed to be like a magnificent flickering ripple moving forever in space like the pulsation of a great heart sending its energies through a vast network of arteries and uh, nourishing each of these separate entities. Thus, uh, the circulation of deity through the universe seems to have been one of the points that was lurking in the background of the minds of these Muslim scientist mystics. They saw light, they saw all these elements as pulsating atomic forms. And this pulsation to them was merely the evidence of the continual presence of deity, forever reaffirming its own existence in the very substances of creation. Now after the, uh, the rise of Arabic and Muslim thinking, the atomic theory slowly drifted back again into Europe. It came in through Spain and the Moorish universities there, and it found some habitation in the thinking of the early medieval uh, Westerner, or European. But for a long time it did not make any general gain beyond the boundaries established by the traditional authorities, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, it is interesting and remarkable that at a time when religion as theology was practically dominating the entire thinking of the world, Plato and Aristotle were still encouraged and taught in the great university systems of Europe. So the European mind, uh, awaking from the darkness of the Dark Ages, awoke with the basic concept that matter was an infinite number of minute particles and that from these particles all form and structure were built. This was about what they had uh, to build a philosophy upon as far as matter was concerned. Uh, these infinite minute particles were like a vast beach of fine sand and uh, you could run the sand through your fingers or you could moisten it and build uh, castles in the sand or you could do all kinds of things with this sand. Matter, therefore, to all intent and purposes, was an invisible sand. This sand uh, could be shaped into any form whatsoever. Now, less perhaps than the Muslim was the European attitude toward the presence of God in the compound. Uh, to, Christian, to Christendom, during that period at least, deity was always an extrinsic force. Deity was not in the sand, but ruled the sand. Deity was something that could command the sand. But deity's own existence was separate. Deity played to the sand as man would. He allowed it to run through his fingers. There was no clear understanding as to where the original sand came from. It sort of emerged from the unknown. And uh, the Europeans followed some of them, the atomic theories of the Greeks, and came to the conclusion that uh, the atom and vacuum were eternally existing factors. But because of the very nature of European thinking and the very nature of the European thinker, there was a gradual modification of this point of view. Being rather inclined to observationalism, even though somewhat frustrated in their intellectual inquiry, the Europeans began to work over this theory. And even at the, at the time of the Renaissance, a kind of materialism was arising in human life, which was some time later to be clearly uh, stated by humanism. The European was rebelling against this ever-present God in everything, or this ever-ruling uh, God over everything. 
his own ego was uh, coming to be stronger. And the individual began to think of himself as a creating power rather than constantly thinking of deity as an arbitrary despot. So even in the 14th and 15th centuries, at the time of Roger Bacon, for example, uh, the, the theological boundaries set up around the study of matter began to break down in European thinking. It was true that Europe still had four kinds of atoms corresponding to the four elements, earth, fire, air, and water. Uh, Europe had not really gone too far beyond the thinking of Leucippus and the Greek atomists. But there was this uh, continuous uh, tendency to look upon matter as a fact in itself, a fact uh, not dependent upon something spiritual or something divine. One way, of course, of doing this was to follow the earlier materialistic thinking of both the Greeks and the East Indians, and that is to assume that this matter had an eternal existence of itself, that it did not need to be created, that it did not need to have an explanation of a divine cause or a proximate divinity uh, within it. This matter was a principle, a substance, and a nature. And over the surface of this matter, according to uh, the ancient religious concepts, spirits moved. Divine powers were called upon. But in the explanation of the atomic processes, these divine powers were called upon less frequently with every passing century. So that actually matter began to take the form of a reality in contrast to deity. Uh, deity being a kind of abstraction, something that it was difficult to demonstrate, something hard to delineate, whereas matter offered certain definite inducements. One of the earliest procedures that came up in European thinking about atoms was the tendency uh, to remove the Greek boundary of thinking and assume that an atom was a divisible unit. Uh, the European mind was naive, but it stated itself somewhat like this. Uh, we say, or you say, that the smallest possible form of existence is the atom. And because it is the smallest possible unit, it is indivisible. But if I conceive of the smallest possible unit, I can still conceive of half of it. There is, uh, there is no way of getting around the infinite fact that there is no unit so minute that I cannot conceive that it has parts. I can reduce it as small as I want to, or as small as I can. But I can still say, even when I can no longer think of it being any smaller, I can still say that it could be half that size. There is, uh, there is no boundary upon the possibility of the, of the unit being divided. Therefore, the, the European began to develop his concept of the divisible atom. Now, when he thought of the divisible atom, he began to also think of what kind of parts these would be. But he gained a moment or a flash of the practical, for at that moment he was no way able to cope with this situation. So he simply affirmed that such parts, such as they might be, and they could be, uh, could only be actually conceived of in relations to the atom. In other words, a half atom, a quarter atom, a sixth atom you still couldn't go much smaller because actually as soon as the atom took any boundaries formed and appeared to be comprehensible it was no longer the atom you had to go to something smaller so the atom was then however for the first time really assumed to be subject to cleavage subject to division separation or reduction of some kind this led, of course, to a great deal of speculation 
But I think the principal end attained by all this process was that it reduced the concept of matter uh, to a condition in which for the first time matter and vacuum began to be terms for the same thing. If you reduced matter sufficiently, what you had left was what had been assumed to be vacuum. Consequently, matter and vacuum now came to be two terms for one fact or one essential substance, namely that vacuum is not true vacuum. The vacuum is an inconceivable mass of the minute parts of the first conceivable substance, that therefore vacuum uh, partook of the same essential nature as atom. An atom in vacuum merely represented particles of one size existing in particles of a lesser size. Now, vacuum as being composed of particles is still a little difficult for us to conceive of. But then vacuum itself is probably a misnomer to begin with. While they were struggling with this problem, they were probably nearer to the fact than the terms permitted. For actually, we have no proof uh, that complete and absolute vacuum exists. We know that certain relative degrees of vacuum do exist, but we have no way of knowing that vacuum itself is not composed of infinitely minute conditions, states, energies, or substances of some kind. We have never found this pure vacuum. And of course, religion stepped in at this time in Europe and pointed out that as God is everywhere, there cannot be a vacuum. There cannot be pure vacuum. That which is left, or when all material substances cease, is spirit, not vacuum. Now, this was a fine theological point also, but it led to a new approach to the subject of atom, namely that atoms existed in spirit, not in vacuum. The spirit was therefore a life, and gradually to the concept of spirit was be further bestowed the concept of the continuum. Now, the concept of the continuum was in substance or reality that opposed to atoms an infinite number of minute granules or particles. There was another kind of something which was a, 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 a homogeneous mass, indivisible, that this other something was not atomic in structure, but a truly pure, moving, fluidic energy. Now, it could be conceivable that this energy might be a chain of atoms, but it was also conceivable that these atoms formed the vehicle of energy. Therefore, that energy manifesting, we'll say, as electricity may still have an atomic structure. But the pure energy out of manifestation or in its subjective state may be non-structural, just as pure spirit separated from body, a condition which we cannot perceive, may not have any structural similarity to the body which it has inhabited. So for the purpose of their thinking, we have atoms as particles now in relationship to a continuing substance or essence that is non-granular, uh, but is rather a smooth and unchanging material, and that in this the atoms exist. Now the thought of existence to medieval man was associated with one very simple thing because it was a common experience of his own life, namely that to exist in Europe in the 13th century was to be hungry. Consequently, something had to be done about this. How is the atom maintained? Is the atom maintained by any conceivable form of nutrition? This problem of feeding the atom began to take on a little meaning. All larger composite bodies have to be nourished in some way. How is the atom nourished? Is the atom 
by its very nature a continuing self-nourishing thing. Is the atom totally sufficient to itself? Is the atom the unit in which consciousness, intelligence, force, substance, energy, all these elements of survival are fully, eternally, and inevitably present? If the atom contains all of these to abundance or superabundance, then it becomes obvious that the atom looks more like God every moment. It is minute, but it suddenly becomes omnipotent, omnipresent, omnipresent and omniactive. As against that theory, there was this other problem. Is the atom a little fish swimming in the continuum? And is the continuum the source of its nutrition? Is this atom, therefore, dependent upon this mysterious indivisible essence for its own existence? Is it nourished? Is it this continuum or substance by which it is sustained for an inconceivable period of time, or perhaps into which it dies, disintegrates, and disappears? Just as the planet exists in space, is space, therefore, now something that has an essential nature? And is the atom, therefore, a progeny of space? Is it a mysterious living thing that has oozed out of the continuum? The thinking on this uh, undoubtedly perturbed our medievals for quite a time, but then they had not very much to think about anyway, so I guess they had time enough for the particular job they were doing. The next point that more or less became obvious I think was stimulated by the rise of chemical speculations and the gradual interpretation of biology and physics in terms of chemistry and alchemy. The alchemists came along in this, and they also had some contributions to make. They liked to think of the four elements still, and of the fifth element, the uh, mysterious agoth of uh, Paracelsus, and they began to think now of atomic commixture in terms of chemical formula. They discovered that you could take chemicals and put them together and alter them in various ways. And out of all of their alchemical speculations, they came to one conclusion, namely that there was a basic element, a basic substance, into which all other elements and all other substances were reducible. That in this basic or inevitable substance, we had a common denominator of all elements and all compounds. If, therefore, you wish to change gold, uh, base metal into gold or gold into silver, you could not do this with the finished product. You had to, first of all, reduce the material you intended to transform until it reached the neutral core state. And then you had to repolarize it into the substance you wished to produce. You could not, therefore, make a base metal into gold with a hammer. You couldn't demand or force this change. But you had to build upon the fact that there was gold in all metal. Therefore, you had to reduce your material until the gold seed could be isolated and caused to grow more rapidly than the other seeds, whereupon your substance would gradually change into gold. So that uh, the alchemists suggested a compounding as being the basis of infinite differentiation. They also pointed out uh, that in addition to building up these substances as compounds, it was perfectly possible to realize that entirely new substances could be discovered or could be noted if we had analyzed compounds, and that in turn two or more familiar elements, if brought together, could cause a totally unfamiliar compound. This had a very serious effect gradually upon the idea of four elements 
as being the four streams of atoms, as we mentioned before. Now it became obvious that the elements themselves were compounds, not primaries. And although in modern thinking we try to assume that elements represent irreducible patterns or compounds, the fact still exists uh, that the ancients uh, were laboring with four elements, all of which were later discredited. For instance, they believed that water was an element uh, that existed in space in its own condition and that the atoms composing water were a peculiar and inevitable kind of element or atom. Then somebody woke up one day and discovered that water is the result of the combining of hydrogen and, uh, and oxygen, H2SO4, and that therefore your water was not a primary at all. Therefore you did not and could, uh, could not maintain the theory uh, that the uh, idea uh, that the element of water had any subsistence. It was simply uh, the combination of hydrogen and oxygen. Therefore, you had a new basis now upon which to create your elements. Could you go now to hydrogen and oxygen and say that those were your basic principles and that the, a certain family of atoms produced these? Well, by this time, the thinking was a little bit, um, shall we say, disillusioned. Uh, one by one, very pet, very long-held theories fell apart. And for quite a time, um, there was a general discouragement in atomic research. Uh, it was obvious that the individual did not have the necessary instruments within his own consciousness to advance this pattern beyond the state of speculation. But there always have been and always will be dynamic speculative thinkers. And uh, the next pattern uh, came at it from an almost completely different position. Uh, after the chemists more or less gave it up uh, because of the conflict that arose in their own thinking, uh, uh, atomism in Europe passed to the keeping of the almost completely philosophic school. So that your great early modern atomists were mostly philosophers. The sciences were unable to cope with the situation at that time. Although, as we know, many of the philosophers of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries were also great pioneers in the level of science. They were scientists, philosophers. They were realists. Uh, they were seeking for practical, physical explanations for the problems that existed. Now, in this situation, Lord Bacon made his little contribution uh, to the problem of atoms. His contribution, very largely, was the introduction of the concept of motion, and that motion resulted from heat. Therefore, that in some mysterious way, all atomic action was dependent upon heat. In a state of coldness, atoms became quiescent. There was no atomic function in the uh, absence, the total absence of heat. But the moment that heat was introduced into a pattern, the particles began to move, and that these the motions were therefore the result of the effect of heat upon both the atom and the vacuum or space in which it existed. This led to a series of rather profound philosophical conclusions uh, to the effect that heat and life become synonymous terms. That the thing that is warm is alive, the thing that is cold is dead that coldness is associated with inertia and that heat is associated with activity. Consequently, the entire universal procedure, the mystery of creation, the mystery of the formation of atomic patterns, 
uh, the release of the energies of atoms, all this must, all these things must be associated with heat. That by means of heat, these particles are mysteriously set in motion. Now this heat may be beyond our comprehension in the minuteness of its warmth, in the same way that the atom is beyond our comprehension in the minuteness of its size. But there has to be, therefore, heat, and it is almost certainly in two conditions or states. One is the heat of life in the thing. The atom to be alive must have a core of warmth in it somewhere. And in order to be moved, it must also be placed in an, in an atmosphere or a situation of warmth. So there is internal warmth and there is external warmth. The internal warmth animates the atom, the external warmth moves the atom. Well, we say, why would not the internal warmth of itself be sufficient? The answer being that if this warmth is evenly distributed through a spherical body, it would not move it. Therefore, the warmth can animate the body, but a motion must be contributed to the body to cause it to move. Uh, lacking uh, this explanation, you would then have to attribute motion to an intelligent activity of that body, in which it moves in a direction according to volition of some nature. And uh, Europe wasn't quite ready to cope with the problem of the intelligent atom. Therefore, it had to leave that uh, for the moment. Probably one of the most interesting thinkers that we had in the field of atomism was von Leibniz. And I, th I suspect that with his thinking, the golden age of atomism burst upon European thinking. Uh, Leibniz was an idealist. Leibniz was to a large measure a mystic. It has been suspected for many years that he was an alchemist and a Rosicrucian initiate. But in any event, Leibniz, uh, in his theory of the monad, or that system now called the monadology of Leibniz, uh, moves this entire pattern from the profane level of our common scientific thinking uh, to the much more attenuated level of our mystical insight. The whole problem of atoms suddenly emerges in the consciousness of von Leibniz as a, a spiritual phenomenon. To him, therefore, the monad, or the infinitely minute particle of existence, is not matter, but life, it is not a substance, but a spirit. Leibniz then takes the ground that matter is nothing but a condition of spirit. And in this he comes very close uh, to the mystical and metaphysical thinking of the 18th and 19th centuries. To him, therefore, this spirit is really God. And he uses his monadology very largely to rationalize his theology. He builds us a religion around the monad, or around the atom, and shows that it is quite possible and conceivable that an entire moral, ethical, spiritual code of existence could be built upon this mysterious intangible that we call the infinite matter particle. The monadology assumes something like this. First of all, that everything that exists is essentially a monad or an atom. That a monad is essentially itself a spiritual energy, a spiritual power held together or united in the most subtle of all forms or bodies. And that this form or body is simply a very slight modification of the very life principle which animates it. The monad, therefore, is a fixed point inhabiting place and space as a spiritual germ, 
And the nearest thing that we can liken it to is not the grain of sand anymore, but a minute seed, bearing within itself not only the power to germinate, as intrinsic within itself, but likewise containing within its own monadal existence the totality of its own nature. Um, Leibniz's famous saying that there are no windows in monads is one of the points involved. He brings to the problem this complete thought, therefore. The monad is a total entity. It is self-directive. All existence that moves from it already exists in it. And in the monad, then, we have not only the concept of the seed, but we have within it now the concept of a sleeping archetypal force. Any monad has the possibility of releasing from itself everything that is necessary to the perfect objective manifestation of itself. Now, Leibniz does not say that essentially all monads have to be alike. Therefore, he does not insist that the potentials of all monads are identical. But he does bring out definitely that the monad does not require any assistance outside of itself. That the monad is forever alone and never alone. That the supreme monad may rightly and properly be called the absolute. That the absolute, therefore, is an infinite unit, the source of all other units and provides archetypally the appearance justification of all other units, or stamps them with the likeness of itself. Consequently, all nomads are in some measure and way uh, symbols of the one absolute monad. This one absolute monad is consequently the cause not only of the universe, but of God as we know it. That God is a product existing or a being existing in the absolute monad. And that this absolute monad contains absolutely within itself consciousness, intelligence, and activity. All so-called external processes, therefore, are belong to the Muslim concept of accidents. Out of this moralizing on the nature of the monad, uh, Leibniz comes to an almost Buddhistic conclusion that nothing happens to anyone except that which that person interprets from its own internal totality. In this sense of the word, we are surrounded by all kinds of things. But these things do not affect us. Our own attitude about these things affects us. And if we are indifferent to these things, they have no effect upon us whatever. Yet total indifference to all external things would not result in the impoverishment of the internal. Because all directive comes from within. And the monad now takes on the um, qualities and attributes of a source of insight, a source of energy, a source of character, and a, a throne or establishment of a deity within the individual. Monads, therefore, are complete in themselves. And all things which they form now participate of their own completeness. And if a compound is composed of three monads, then that is a completeness. If there are three million monads, that is still a completeness. For whatever compound of monads is produced, this compound is a completeness in itself. Monads are of more than one order. Monads are both material and spiritual. Spiritual monads are of several qualities. 
some of them essentially mental and some of them essentially psychic. But all of these different monads, regardless of their compositions and the degrees of attenuation in which they exist, are total units, uh, total entities. And uh, these total entities are forever re restating themselves. Therefore, all compounds of monads become monads. And any time you reduce a monad, you reduce it to another monad. There can be nothing else. If, therefore, you take away monads, you still have a monad, but it has been deprived. If you add to uh, the, a group of monads, you still have a monad, but it has been augmented. The effect of the monad as a unity is never altered. All things, by inevitable, inflexible, and immutable laws, form unities. And these unities become new compounds. And in each of these new compounds, uh, there is a primary monad, by means of which this compound is, so to say, ensouled. And the structure is forever uh, a series of interrelated independences. The fulfillment of infinite destiny. But its destiny is not the destiny of the psychic monad, which may be regarded as the governor of that body. Consequently, uh, the body is composed always of self-sufficient units that are not truly dependent upon each other, but which are held in a relationship by a superior psychic monad, which we call the soul. The, the soul, by uh, so uniting these monads, attains a new unity for itself. But in so doing, it does not injure or in any way detract from the totality of the parts which are used to make up its structure. If, therefore, this structure should cease or die, then these various monadal lives or atomic lives are simply released again into their own natural existence. Now comes a good question. Supposing a monad or atom is incorporated into the big toe of some human being. That human being dies. The, the disintegration that follows means the liberation of this atom or monad which then returns to another state and awaits reincorporation into some other structure. Does the atom know that it has ever been in anybody's toe? This is a very vital question if you're an atom. This, uh, this suddenly takes on grave importance. Uh, it might be the same way as asking, assume that man is an atom or a compound monad and that man himself is in some way involved in the structure of a being so immense that man cannot comprehend the nature of that being. That perhaps man is also an atom in the toe of some infinite cosmic form. Uh, man, because no being is capable of comprehending that which is essentially its superior, Man, therefore, has no way of knowing the nature of that which is superior to himself. He only has a way of knowing his own kind and that which is inferior to himself and over which he has gained the victory of comprehension. Therefore, man can know other men. He can also gradually master the mysteries of lower forms of life around him but he is not able to ascend to a quality state superior to himself. Therefore, he can explore the universe only on a level or on a plane. He can go as far as matter will take him, but if he loses contact with the kind of matter with which he is familiar, he loses orientation and consciousness. So the great doubt remains as to where man fits into this vast monadal structure.
But for practical purposes, it is next assumed, perhaps borrowing a little from the Muslim again, that these various atoms or monads uh, by laws innate within themselves are drawn together uh, to form various arrangements and designs and that in this process they become ensouled by superior monadic principles and that in this sense also we see how a certain number of atoms uniting together to form molecules thereby come under the psychic unity of a molecule. This psychic unity exists only so long as the atoms remain in this relationship, and with their separation the molecule itself ceases. This brought not only Leibniz but also the great French uh, philosopher René Descartes uh, and uh, the Baconian theory into a new focus because something has gradually been added to the picture. And the next problem uh, that uh, confronted these intellectuals was to solve certain inevitable doubts that all of this thinking generated. Uh, one of these doubts lay in a certain phenomena which was observed. And that was a phenomenon which we may call uh, contraction and expansion. Or we may also uh, perhaps refer to it in another way as evaporation or condensation. In other words, in the actual experimenting in the laboratory and in uh, the compounding of chemical substances, it had been observed that certain changes take place and the methods by which these changes can be estimated uh, were not adequate. So we, there's something had to be done about it. This type of situation then caused a well-known simile which has extended down through the centuries. Namely that your atoms can be likened to a group of persons. In other words, you have a hundred atoms gathering in the public park for a picnic. These atoms have now uh, gathered around the luncheon table and we might say are in a state of congestion, later perhaps indigestion, but now only congestion. This group of a hundred has gradually come together as tightly as it could, forming an ever smaller group. As soon as lunch is over, an expansive process goes into action. These people begin to separate and to perhaps take on various activities. They decide they'll play games or they will take walks along the countryside and your unit enlarges, becoming less dense as it enlarges. Somewhere along the line also, two or three families composing this unit decide to go home. So they walk right out of the compound entirely, and we even now use the same slang phrase that was used 300 years ago for the atom. We say these people evaporate. They disappear. Now after they have been gone for a while, two or three other families that were late in getting an invitation to the picnic, or got lost trying to find it, move in, producing what we may call the opposite of evaporation. And that is precipitation. Someone new comes into the compound. And this compound is in a constant state, therefore, of motion. Now we know in the study of the problem that this motion exists. That in motion and in nature, these expansive and contractive processes do go on. And uh, the medieval and early modern atomists decided that it was easier to assume that these atoms uh, could separate and come together, that it was to assume that some kind of a glutinous mass, which had no separate unit parts, could expand and contract. This meant that the selection for the expansion and contraction theory 
was the atom rather than the continuum, because the continuum represented a substance uh, which would have to expand and contract within the continually interfering boundaries of itself, whereas the atom could expand and contract in an, a vacuum or in space or in any substance less uh, gross or less uh, precipitated than itself. This then caused also a very uh, pleasant and interesting by thought to come in, and that was that the expansion and contraction of these atoms, like the story of the picnickers, also implied another element present, namely air. Uh, if the picnicker left his group, he was, so to say, displaced. Something took his place. Uh, when uh, one person left the group, he did not leave vacuum behind him. Not even the vacuum is uh, left by his own body. His own displacement was immediately filled. The next thing that was re regarded as interesting and vital was that there was no proof that although these atoms got nearer and nearer together or became more and more separated, there was no actual factual proof that they ever actually touched. Now, the ancients thought that they did. The ancients thought that they hooked into each other in some cases, or that by certain kinds of gravitational uh, pull they were drawn together, or that by a peculiar qualitative likeness they had a psychic attraction for each other and moved together. But then came the later question, is this necessary? Are we dealing with any substance sufficiently dense that we can demonstrate beyond doubt that there is no space between its atoms. And the 17th century uh, philosopher scientists, still working entirely by their own inductive procedures, came to the conclusion that although substances appeared to be solid, that there was no proof that every substance was not largely space just as the human body is largely water, and that the atoms, so-called, making subst uh, so, uh, solid substances, really are only relatively nearer or further from each other. That if they are relatively a little nearer, the invisible becomes visible. If they are relatively a little further apart, the visible becomes invisible. The boundary line in this pattern of coordination is so abstract that we can only say that a certain degree of pattern we can see and a certain degree of pattern we cannot see. Also, the question then naturally comes up as to the relationship between the space occupied by atom and the actual displacement by atom. And it is assumed that the atoms in a pattern occupy a space much greater than their displacement, and therefore that they exist within an area or an environment uh, which permeates between them, extends around them, and so to say forms their most immediate and intimate relationship. Now, if you have a group of such atoms, and each atom is, as uh, Leibniz insists, alive, that there is a root core of spirit energy in every atom. You bring these atoms into compound. You bring them nearer and nearer together. You form out of them, for instance, a hollow sphere or something similar to that, or perhaps a solid sphere. But this solid sphere is only relatively solid. It is solid in the sense that it has become visible, tangible, cognizable by us. But actually no two of its atomic particles actually touch. But if they are near enough to give the impression of a solid, then comes the question, what is the effect of the life principle in each of these monads upon this solid? 
Does this life principle result in a kind of induction? Is there an energy field set up by magnetic chemistry involving this new unit of atomic organization? Does this fact that these forms are alive, even though they are infinitely minute, cause the compound to experience some kind of animation also? Is it possible that as the physical elements reach a certain design, that the core energies of these elements are then also brought into a relationship, and that by this relationship certain psychic factors or psychic energies can also be released into manifestation. Leibniz thought they could. Most of the philosophers of that period more or less suspected that what we call the soul is really this interplay of psychic polarities of atoms. This uh, was uh, accepted rather early by the materialists, and it is still more or less uh, accepted on the level of materialistic sciences. The, the soul is still a byproduct. It is still something which originates in the chemistry of the body, yet is superior to this chemistry in rational and emotional potential, but cannot survive the, the dissolution of this chemistry by death. So that the soul does represent a kind of higher energy released from matter. Leibniz took the form, rather, of the reverse, namely that the uh, monad, or the atom, in its physical sense, was released from its own spiritual root, or spiritual source. Going back again for a few moments, then, to Leibniz, because we want to clear two or three other points in connection with his thinking, we have a mystical atomism gradually developing. We have now the concept that deity uh, is atomic, that uh, there is a sovereign archetypal atomic entity which is called the absolute, that this absolute is the perfect, all-powerful atom that this might also be regarded as the ancestral atom, the atom from which atoms come. There is some question as to how Leibniz attempted to solve this point. He rather assumed, I think, the existence of an absolute, and that this absolute, by its own absoluteness, could, be not, could not be subjected to any further investigation or analysis that it represented an existing, totally continuing, always enduring totality, and that it was a compound or universal atom, the monad, the great monad. That this monad was essentially a spiritual being or a spiritual thing, but that in its totality it was inwardly spiritual, outwardly physical, and between these polarities, psychical. So that this monad contains a center, a radius, and a circumference. And for practical purposes, the center was spiritual, the radius was psychic, and the circumference was physical. Thus all things that would exist in plane or condition exist in the monad. This monad, being absolute, might be considered the universal structure, or it may be considered the pattern for all lesser structures. More of Leibniz has this one other uh, borrowing from antiquity, namely to him, all these monads uh, were microcosms of this greater monad. And all monads, therefore, are microcosmic um, facsimiles of their superiors, or those larger powers from which they are suspended. In this sense, perhaps, the suggestion of Plotinus, the Neoplatonist, who describes the gods as effulgent blossoms from which the worlds are suspended. 
these effulgent blossoms, like the chakras of India, might be regarded as monadal. They may be regarded as living units of force and existence. Each of these, therefore, having its own psychic life, we come finally to man. Now, man is a creature with an internal nature. This we appreciate. He is also a creature with an external nature, and we are inclined to assume that this external nature is the greater reality of man. We see it, we clothe it, we feed it, therefore it is. Actually, according to Leibniz, this material form is simply the wall of a monad. The body is a kind of wall. Uh, dividing from dividing the monad from space. And each monad exists as a self in space. Now, it has no bearing upon whether there are 50,000 of these monads assembled at the Colosseum to watch a very strenuous baseball game or something of that kind. This has no bearing upon it. For each being, Existence consists of self and space. That's all there really is. The rest of the relationship of existence is an emotionalization of these facts. The individual can create within himself explanations of relationships. But these relationships have no existence except in the explanations that he gives them. Thus a man may say, by way of association, referring to a neighboring monad, this is my friend. The other monad may agree with him on this particular point and say, well, I think that's pretty nice. I'll also be your friend. Now we have two friendly monads. These two friendly monads seemingly have come to some way by which the space interval between them has been reduced. But actually, although it may be reduced, it can never be eliminated. And according to Leibniz, these two monads that have physically shaken hands and are going to be pals from now on, actually can never meet. It is utterly impossible. They can have certain physical symptoms or symbolisms of meeting, but they cannot actually meet, for neither of these monads can experience the other in the least degree. Neither of these monads can live the life of the other in the slightest degree. They can never coalesce. They can never become one being. They can never share together the intimate experiences of any form of psychic consciousness. All they can do is try to understand each other from the outside. All they can say is, uh, more or less to themselves, if he is as I am, this is the way he will act. This is the basis of the great disappointment of life, because the other fellow is not ourselves. Therefore, he does not act according to our expectancy. Therefore, we do not like him anymore. But we bestow upon him an explanation of himself, which is nothing but an interpretation of ourselves. We can do nothing with him. He may live in the same house. He may eat at the same table. We may be married to him for 40 years. But the space interval cannot be eliminated because the monad has no windows and no doors. It is a completely psychologically introverted existence. Its so-called extroversion is merely a function of its own imagination. Extroversion has really very little to do with the world on the outside. It has only to do with our reaction to that world. So the monad, never being able to be anything but itself, never being able to escape from itself, can never actually 
satisfy its own need in any way outside of itself. Now here we get to a philosophy situation that is quite reminiscent of Buddhism. Because in Buddhism, the last words of the teacher before the nirvana were simply these, work out your salvation with diligence. It was an essential principle of Buddhism that no individual could be saved by another. And as far as that goes, no individual could come to any permanent measure of contentment or of good or of security or of insight as a result of the intercession of another being. Later this was modified in Buddhism, but in the primitive form this was essentially the concept. So now we have Leibniz working with the isolated, bottled uh, monad, capsulated within its own existence. But, says Leibniz, there is nothing necessary, there is nothing necessary uh, to the perfection of this life that is not, not already within it. Therefore, perfection is a power inevitably resident in the monad itself. There is nothing that the being requires that the monad itself cannot provide, and that the entire situation is therefore one of immediately recognizing the true source of security and moving toward it. The individual without calling upon the resources of his own intelligence may ask the advice of others and later regret it. Whereas had he realized that he possessed the basic intelligence, he would have known that he could develop the quality by which he could solve his own problem. The, uh, the lonely monad, reaching out to find companionship, finds actually the only possible enduring companionship within its own existence, and that is its association with the divine or absolute monad at the root of itself. Thus all exterior, exterior things are but symbols, and according to Leibniz, have values only because of our own interpretation. If the interpretive mind of man suddenly lost all of its glamorizing processes and simply faced fact, the world would turn into a pale gray haze. Nothing would continue to have any significance or importance whatsoever. Uh, but this is not the way man functions. Therefore, under the condition of his existing consciousness, he has to divide. He therefore has to have a world in being and a world in seeming. And this again goes back to your very early philosophical doctrines of Parmenides. The world of being is the world of the monad. The world of seeming is the world by means of which, by his conduct, man denies the totality of his own being and seeks outside of himself for the fulfillment of life. Thus you can understand how the concept of the atom or the concept of the monad began to affect the philosophical thinking of man, how it began to affect his belief in immortality, how it uh, affected his moral and ethical life. And we can go back to Leibniz because Leibniz now also has for our consideration the moral atom. Actually, good is one of the natural attributes of the atom. The atom is by nature good, uh, by nature uh, dedicated to the fulfillment of the divine pattern which is locked within itself. The monad unfolds as the human body unfolds, uh, as the original covering of the primordial cell expands through cell fission in the human body, it finally becomes the epidermis. And the skin with which we observe the body to be covered is nothing more or less than the gradual enlarging, increasing, and expanding of the original wall of the first cell from which this being was created. 
so that the monads, though it may expand, uh, the walls of it never break. It, uh, division takes place within it, as Pythagoras says, but itself it is not divided. So the monad is always a symbol of unity which is not broken up or lost by the multiplication of parts, leading in their turn to the increase of size, body, or volume. This suggests a good many different points, but we're getting now gradually to one that has to have the greatest primary interest to us because of the situations that have developed. We began way back with the Greeks by thinking only of monad and vacuum, or atom and vacuum. We gradually came down uh, through various levels of thinking in which the, the atom is merely a speck of this or a speck of that or is the unit stone from which compounds are fashioned, regarded as stone, as sand, as matter, as substance, as material. And it came to be assumed that all physical things were composed of physical substances. But now Leibniz gives us the next interesting clue. And while he did not possess the formulas, he did possess a measure of the insight, which was to affect the study of atomism in more recent times. He suddenly recognized that the atom was essentially not matter, that the atom was life, that the unit was not a material or a substance, but an energy. Now, this was, uh, this was the beginning, really, of something that was to take form later. That actually this monad, to which he uh, referred so frequently, was a spiritual being embodied, even though this being was very tiny and the body was infinitesimal. We can't even see it. Still, this unit monad was primor primarily life. And in this life, it was primarily linked to absolute life. Now, this requires only one more step uh, to ch continue this process of chain reaction. In the Leibniz theory, following in this case certain of the earlier Greeks, each degree or level of monad was suspended from a superior by which it was also ensouled. And the life of a superior uh, flowed into the inferior. But because the life of the superior was X, and the life of the inferior was less than X, the larger or superior monad had to create a number of lesser monads, the total of this lesser group being able to accept and be ensouled by the X. In other words, if the lesser monad was only one-tenth the, the power of the greater, then it would be necessary to have ten of these lesser ones to diffuse the power of the greater one through them. But the power so diffused by emanation, and we can go to the Gnostics for this theory, the power so diffused was not lost to the older or higher monad. So this monad simply uh, experienced a division but was not divided, and its energy was diffused through ten interior divisions of itself. In turn, these ten each would uh, require a certain number, perhaps another ten, on the next lower level, or the next level of reduction in volume and uh, energy, and so on down. But through all of these different size groups, all these different emanation groups, from the lowest to the highest, uh, went one thread, as is described in the Gita, 
the single thread binding together all the beads of the rosary. This means that if you touch energy anywhere, you touch at the same time energy everywhere. Because anywhere is merely a hypothetical monadal unit in everywhere. And everywhere is an infinite number of anywheres. Each of these separate parts uh, being and vitalized by one common energy. Leibniz, by transforming the atom from a particle of matter to a point of energy in space, prepared the way for the more complicated thinking of modern times. He prepared the way for the concept of chain reaction. He prepared the way uh, for the realization uh, of, the, of the universalization of the sick atom or the universalization of the injury to the atom. He prepared the way for a very elaborate theory and philosophy of the interdependence of life. For he pointed out in this simple manner uh, that, ev that anything is a door to everything and that all this process moves inward, not outward. That therefore to touch the energy core of any living thing is actually to touch the energy core of the absolute itself. The absolute is not one place and the finite in another place. Actually, the finite is merely the extension of the absolute. And that any point anywhere in space is equally near to the absolute center of energy. Because this energy is no longer in terms of place. It is truly in terms of being. It is azonic. Its center is everywhere. Its circumference is nowhere. If, therefore, we dabble with the atom or the monad, we are therefore dabbling with universal energy, of which the monad is the symbolic unit. Now, I think Leibniz had a point here that was uh, perhaps theologically not acceptable to the people of his time, but which was a clue to his own insight in recognizing the identity of spirit, energy, and activity, and force. That these are names for the conditions of one thing. Also, Leibniz postulated the concept that all of these atomic substances are immortal for the reason that they contain within themselves the potentials of the only immortal thing that exists, and that is the absolute. Consequently, all atoms can change. All atoms can be reduced or augmented in various ways. But no atom can be actually destroyed. Consequently, the only possible implication from this, in terms of our own theories concerning the splitting of the atom and uh, the apparent complete disintegration of the atom, we are forced to assume, if Leibniz is right, that what we call this disintegrative process is merely the abrupt motion of the pattern of an atom from one level to another, that the atom is not actually destroyed that the atom is not split, truly, but that in order to achieve the effect, it is necessary for the atom to move through an energy barrier, just as a plane going through the sound barrier it causes an abrupt explosion. So an atom by being transformed so that it is forced to abruptly move through a barrier between two kinds of atoms, 
apparently in this process, has to go through a quality barrier. And in passing through this quality barrier, there is a tremendous and instantaneous change in its own construction. And this change in its own construction is accompanied by a violent physical symptom. Now this violent physical symptom, having occurred to an atom, and having resulted in a certain vibratory change, it is quite conceivable that this change now affects all other atomic substances keyed to the same level of polarity. Therefore, that in a mysterious way, all of the atoms of a certain kind are moved, agitated, or disturbed because they have one core. And if, for example, you take a reservoir from which a city secures its water, if you infect this reservoir, all of the people become sick. If you disturb the atomic balance or the monadal balance of a certain kind of atom or monad, then this disturbance is carried immediately by chain reaction through a vast area of this particular or peculiar type of monadal structure. Now, there are more, there's more than one type of monad. But according to Leibniz, after the effect of the disturbance is exhausted on its own level, the disturbance may continue upon other levels and continue onward until the disturbance is finally absorbed in the absolute monad, because the absolute monad must also possess within itself both calmness and disturbance. And no change can occur in the monad unless this change is archetypally present in the absolute atom. But now Leibniz is giving us a concept which could very easily lead into the realization that the, uh, the atom is the key to infinite energy resource. But that this key is an extremely dangerous one and a very subtle one, and a difficult one to control and direct. The question as to what actually occurs in the so-called fission of the atom is still not too well uh, understood. A certain process seems to produce this phenomenon. But the entire reason is still obscure and is in a highly hypothetical state, uh, subject to further revision. But the fact does remain that we know that something happens. We know that one of the most terrible combustions that we can conceive of occurs when this atom is bombarded. That it results in a tremendous change in structure. This proves also that every atom has an incredible energy potential. Now, this energy potential locked in the atom, according to Leibniz, is actually, in a sense, uh, the future assurance of this uh, atom. This, this energy is not supposed to be exploded any more than a great forest of trees is supposed to be burned by vandalism. If these things happen, uh, the results and consequences must be coped with. But the purpose of this enormous energy that is locked within the atom is that this energy shall gradually move into manifestation through the ultimate development of the atomic resource of this atom. If we are, for instance, to assume that every atom is a potential sun, and as Leibniz pointed out, there is no end to the growth of this atomic body or being, the little atoms that we know today, so small that we cannot see them, may unfold into solar systems, may unfold into cosmic chains or galaxies, may finally unfold beyond anything that we can conceive. Why can they do this? And how do they do it? Simply because infinite resource is locked in each one of them. If, therefore, this explosion which we see, and which can certainly mean only a small part of the actual energy of that atom, 
that this, uh, this explosion might explode into growth if it was normally handled. Just as this great exploding cloud might for a moment appear to be a great tree, so this tree would represent the explosion of the acorn. The acorn gradually, quietly, and peaceably explodes into a great tree. This tree may in turn explode into a forest of trees. But each of those little acorns contains part of that energy. This energy goes on infinitely and indefinitely because this energy partakes of the unit of the absolute. There is no limit to it. But uh, if it unfolds naturally in the course of a billion years, this energy may unfold into a magnificent structure. Or this atom may rest for a billion years before it does anything. But it is still potentially capable under certain conditions and provocations of beginning this incredible unfoldment in which it bursts forth into a universe. The only reason it can do this is because of the energy in it. Consequently, every atom being the seed of a universal life process has almost inexhaustible energy resources. Uh, certainly we have only released a very small fragment of such energy resource. But now, instead of a particle that was just a little bit of sand in the hands of a fashioner of things, we have the gradual dawning of the modern concept that the, end, that the atom is actually a tremendous, vibrant polarity of infinite potential life, and that therefore matter men, stars, and the universe are all forms of life rather than forms of matter. And that what we call matter is only our name for a kind of life, the activity of which is not sufficient for us to re recognize it as life. That there is no such thing as matter. That all matter finally disappears in the monadal unit and that this unit is primor primarily cosmic life, therefore susceptible of releasing cosmic life in various ways, constructively or destructively, under the various provocations uh, by which this energy is moved. So we now get down pretty well to the point where we can start to think about a modern philosophy of atomism. And I guess our time is up, so we thank you very much.